Composition over inheritance. This topic is a bit on the verge of what we consider the scope of functional programming. You might have used both in writing object-oriented code before. You might have also written functional code and use composition without even considering it. The reason why I put this topic here as the last entry of my video series about functional programming is that I associate its rise in popularity in recent years to the disillusionment in object-oriented circles and the general rise in popularity of functional programming concepts. I may be wrong in this, but anyway. Both inheritance and composition address the problem of how to extend existing code with new functionality. We already have some code, possibly from another module, and we want to write something that reuses some parts of that code so that we don't have to repeat ourselves. Or the other way around. We want to write something that can be used by that code and only under the hood works a bit differently from the original implementation. Or maybe there was never original implementation at all, but only some abstractions that tell us how the implementation should be written so that it can be used by the rest of the code. In practice, I'm talking here about abstract classes on the inheritance side versus interfaces or traits on the composition side. And as you can already notice, in many programming languages you can have both. Java and Kotlin have classes and interfaces. Scala has classes and traits. A long time ago we could say that a trait is an interface which can implement some default functionality for its methods, and an interface can't. But since then, interfaces in Java and Kotlin also acquired the possibility to have default methods. In C++, they are even one and the same. An interface is simply an abstract class with no fields and all its methods abstract. On the other hand, Rust is completely on the composition side. We have data structures and traits that can be implemented for those structures. No classes at all, abstract or not. So again, just like in the chapter about expressions versus statements, the difference comes down to how we decide to write our code and how that decision hopefully made in the early stages of the development affects how the code looks like. And to be honest, it's not even so much about which one do we use, but rather how we use them. Even in the code written from scratch with composition in mind, we can sometimes find an abstract class, while interfaces or traits in inheritance-based code are pretty common. The difference, in my opinion at least, is mostly about whether we prefer deep hierarchies of classes where with each layer we have a new type which is built upon other types, or are we rather fans of more loosely linked, pretty much independent types that implement a bunch of interfaces so they can communicate with each other. Okay, but what am I talking about? And where are the examples? It won't be easy to explain this topic with cats, but I will try. Inheritance is about what the type is. There are still places in programming where deep hierarchies of inheritance are alive and kicking. One is graphic user interface, toolkits of widgets like Android SDK, Swing or JavaFX in Java, or Qt in C++. Let's take a look at a simple radio button from Android SDK. Quoting the documentation, a radio button is a two-stage button that can be either checked or unchecked. When the radio button is unchecked, the user can press or click it to check it. Radio button is a special case of compound button, which is a common parent class also for checkbox, toggle and switch. All of the buttons that mark somehow that they were clicked on. In turn, compound button inherits from a regular button that does not know how to do that and is in fact very similar to text view from which it inherits. A text view can display any kind of text and can be clicked too, therefore in Android I, uh, well, I rarely use button, text view is usually enough. 
internal text view inherits from view, which can be virtually anything that Android can display. In short, every descendant is a more specialized version of its direct ancestor. With each level down, we get some new functionality, but also the scope of the class gets more restricted. With each level up, we get something more generic, something that can be used in more ways. Technically, it is possible to write hierarchies in the other direction, more specialized at the top and more generic at the bottom, but I wouldn't recommend such design. Another place where inheritance thrives is in collection libraries, like for example the standard Scala collections library. It's more mixed here. You can see traits and classes together, and it's generally more complex. If you are interested in Scala, I highly recommend you go to the documentation of Scala 2.13 collections. They are exactly the same as the Scala 3 collections. You don't have to read and remember everything, of course, but it will give you a good idea of how to design class hierarchies, and you will probably learn about methods you didn't even know existed. So, inheritance definitely has its place in programming. But I'd like to argue that most of the time, it's not the best way to go. It is used too much and too often in end-user applications, and the main reason why it is used is that we are used to using it. I remember my first contact with it in around 2001, when I was introduced to C++ at the university. After a semester of writing data structures in C, I was out of sudden creating those pyramids of abstract and concrete classes, reusing code and overwriting it. It was like adding new species to the evolutionary tree of my more and more complex code. I thought that, yes, this is advanced programming, I'm a professional now. So, for some time I used it everywhere, even if it was not necessary, or if finding a way to connect two pieces of code by inheritance was very unintuitive. Imagine, for example, a kitten and a duckling. They are both adorable. As you can see, something is not right here. Even if they are adorable, it doesn't mean that they both have a common ancestor that was the adorableness itself. The last common ancestor of cats and ducks was probably a small, definitely not adorable reptile living some 350 million years ago. Them being adorable is not something they inherited. It's a trait they developed independently from each other. And on top of that, sometimes they lose it when they turn into adult animals. Being adorable is then more like something they can do, affect people with their cuteness, than something they are, more likely than having a class kitten extending something adorable, we will have class kitten extending cat with the trait adorable, and similarly we will have the class duckling extending duck with the trait adorable. But aha, you may say back to me, nevertheless, there's obviously a deep hierarchy of evolutionary ancestors of kittens and ducklings, as well as a big phylogenetic tree on both sides. Kittens are cats, cats are felines, felines are mammals, and mammals are animals. The same thing for ducklings. And by the way, if we look into the duck evolutionary tree, then there's got to be a T-Rex somewhere there. This kind of inheritance tree uh, makes sense in theory, but is it useful? When you look at an adorable photo of a kitten and a duckling, and your reaction is awe, oh, do you think you go ah oh, because they both come from a long line of extinct species and or they are categorized into more and more generic groups of animals that are connected at some point? No. You go ah oh, because they are adorable. It's simple as that. There's no inheritance involved. Translating this quite risky metaphor to programming, I would argue that the majority of programs we write are nowhere near so complex that they actually require deep inheritance hierarchies. The code that uses our data models is usually much more interested in what those data models can do than what they are in their essence. And this is how we come to composition, which is about what the type can do. 
In a real end-user app, much more likely than cats and dogs, we will encounter storages, services, and either some kind of UI views or another piece of code that helps us communicate with our program. It's quite possible that for many of those classes, we actually may find their common parts and put them in superclasses. But in most cases, this hierarchy will be flat. One type of abstract storage, one type of abstract service, etc. Instead, if we spot that some parts of code behave similarly and we want to use that, we will do it with composition. With inheritance, we tend to have this mental model that the superclass of several subclasses belongs close to those subclasses. The whole hierarchy, or at least the core part of it, is going to be in the same module. And the subclasses are heavy. There is almost always some code we don't care about, but we still inherit it. With composition, it's the opposite. Interfaces and traits are small, light, and in comparison, more independent from classes that implement them. Imagine we build an application with services and storages, and at some point, we want a service that will handle only adorable data to any storages that can fetch it. To do that, we will create a trait, a durable fetcher, and put it somewhere near the new service. And we will have this method fetch all adorable. Only after that, almost as if it was an afterthought, we will go to the storages and make some of them implement the adorable fetcher trait, so that in the future, the service will know that it can use them to fetch adorable data. So we have an abstract class abstract storage, we will have a kitten storage, which extends abstract storage with adorable fetcher of kittens, and we will have an overridden method fetch all adorable that fetches all adorable cats kittens, but maybe some other adorable adult cats. Well, every cat is adorable. And then we have a class duckling storage that extends an abstract storage, but of ducks this time. And it also implements an adorable fetcher of a duckling. And here we overwrite fetch all adorable to fetch all adorable ducks. Ducklings, but maybe also some other ducks that are adorable. And in the end we will have the all service, which is created with the adorable fetcher of kittens and the adorable fetcher of ducklings. And there we will have a method all adorable that will fetch all adorable kittens and all adorable ducklings and it will return them all together. And also here's our method all that will call the method cuteness overload which comes from the trait adorable and so we can call it on every adorable creature we can find. By using traits, our service is no longer limited to work only with class hierarchies. Literally, anything that implements adorable can be handled by all service. And the same goes for adorable fetcher. There's a reason why I didn't call it a storage. Anything that implements the trait adorable fetcher is now a valid helper for all service. It doesn't have to be a storage. On the other hand, not every storage may fulfill the criteria posed by our service. Some of them cannot fetch anything adorable. The trait adorable fetcher becomes a contract between the service and whatever there is on the other side. In other words, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, then, well, then it can be a T-Rex for all we care because we are interested only in that it fulfills the contract of a duck. In a more serious example, this ability is the basis for mocking classes in the unit tests. A mock is an implementation of an interface that is, well, I would want to say fake, but it really is an implementation. It just doesn't do what a real implementation is supposed to do. Instead, 
the mocking framework lets us build a simplified implementation in a way that we don't even feel that we do it. And then we can create an instance of our tested service with all those storages substituted with the mocked counterparts. Every time the service will access a mocked storage and call one of its methods, it will not run the actual production code, but the implementation provided by the mocking framework. For example, when we run a unit test with the following code, mocked kittens, that is a mocked version of the adorable fetcher of kittens, and when we call fetch all adorable on mock kittens, then we want to return a list of two kittens, Simba and Nala. And this will be transformed into an instance of an anonymous class implementing adorable fetcher of kitten and its implementation of the method fetch all adorable will always return that list of two adorable kittens. Similarly, mocked ducklings will be a mocked version of an adorable fetcher of ducklings and when we call fetch all adorable on mocked ducklings, then a method will be created that will return a list of three ducklings, Huey, Dewey and Louie. To be honest, I never liked those three inductives. And now we can create our very real OR service, which will never know that the both fetchers we pass to it are not real storages of kittens and ducklings, but their mocked counterparts. Thanks to this, we can test the OR service method OR. The code of OR is the same, well, that's the whole point, that's what we want to test, but it will access our mocked implementations of fetch all adorable. In the end, we will get a list of a list composed of our kittens and our ducklings from the mocking code, which will prove that the all method works as it should. Another advantage of this approach is that when you first sit down and design your data structures and methods working on them, you can focus on making them exactly as you want and only then think if you can make them implement a given trait. If doing that is not trivial, you can decide, either you can change something in the code you have just written, or maybe there is another way. For example, maybe you can provide a method that will create an instance of another class from the one you have, and that new class will be able to implement the trait. Think of a collection and an iterator. The second solution provides better separation of concerns, but on the other hand, there is a disadvantage in that it can lead to code duplication. In many cases, an interface is going to be implemented in the same or a very similar way in several classes. But since those implementations are independent of each other, the code has to be repeated. One partial solution to this are default implementations of trace methods. The default implementations may then be overridden in the class which implements the trait, or they may be left as they are. For example, the trait myIterator will have only one abstract method, next, but it will have the default implementations of map and forage, which both use that next method. And then we can have a class, for example, my other complex collection that extends my iterator and it defines the next method. And then we can have my complex collection that creates an iterator and another my co other complex collection that creates another iterator. A class that implements my iterator needs to provide implementations only for the next method, and in return it gets map and forage for free. You can see it working very well in Rust, where you just have to implement a few key traits on your data structure, and suddenly you get a buttload of additional functionality. And this is how we finally reach the end of the series. For sure I would like to make a follow-up video about Scala Futures, which in the Scala functional programming community are viewed with some disdain. I would like to defend them a bit, talk about both their advantages and disadvantages, and look into how their internals work. I really hope you enjoyed the series, and if you learned something new, then well, that's great. Let me know, here in the comments or on Twitter. Also, please look through the series and share with friends anything that you find interesting. All I do is published under the Creative Commons license, so if it can help you in any way, please just take it and use it.